invoking the blessings of Lord Ganesha, offering some flowers to Lord Ganesha. Come, yeah. Professor Sani, Professor Katre, and dear students, I have great pleasure in welcoming you all for this inauguration of the MHRD project, e-learning in mathematics at undergraduate and postgraduate level. This project is funded by MHRD. The idea is to transmit online courses from Bhaskaracharya Pratishthan to colleges in Pune. Under this program, we will be uh, broadcasting two postgraduate courses and two undergraduate courses. During the first semester of 2010-11, the courses which will be broadcast, one on graph theory by Professor Sani from Bombay University, and the other on number theory by Professor Katre from Pune University. During the second semester, a course in algebra will be delivered by Professor Dr. Mangala Narlikar and a course in complex analysis will be delivered by Dr. Shola Purkar from SP College. The idea is all the details about these courses are given in our website elearn.bprim.org. I request the students to keep in touch with this website and also Bhaskaracharya Pratishthana for uh, details about these courses. All details have been given, complete course content, complete timetable about the speakers. So we, I request the students to take maximum advantage of this program because it is meant for them and thereby we will be fulfilling the objectives of M MHRD who has given profusely funding for this project and I thank profusely the MHRD for giving support to this. We'll begin this program today uh, by Professor Sane's lecture on graph theory. Professor Sane is a distinguished mathematician from Bombay University. He has done extensive research in various areas of discrete mathematics, coding theory, graph theory and many other related areas. He has also a lot of experience in teaching uh, graph theory. So you'd be having, receiving the instruction from one of the experts in this field. Also, subsequently, Professor Katre, who is also a well-known number theorist, done extensive research in algebraic number theory, and was also a lot of experience in teaching number theory at various forums. He will be joining this program later by teaching a course on number theory. So you'll also learn number theory from one of the top persons in the field. So I request you all to take good advantage of this program and make this program a success. Thank you. Now I request uh, uh, Professor Sani to begin this program by delivering his lecture on graph theory. The outset, I have to uh, thank uh, uh, Bhaskara Chandra Pratishthan for uh, inviting me to give this uh, series of lectures on graph theory. Um, must also uh, congratulate the team at uh, Bhaskara Chandra Pratishthan, uh, uh, Professor Katre, Professor Gopal Krishnan, and uh, all the others who are uh, working hard to uh, make this program successful and also the participants uh, in the program. Uh, 
it is an uh, experiment for all of us, at least for me, it, it is an experiment because I have uh, uh, live telecast is something I have not uh, uh, indulged in earlier, but I know people who have uh, done similar things, in particular the Open University uh, in England uh, at uh, Milton Keynes uh, conducts uh, courses extensively uh, through e-learning. So, uh, I think this is a, a quite a good initiative that the Bhaskaracharya Pratishthan has taken uh, in this regard. Therefore, uh, I must uh, really compliment Bhaskaracharya Pratishthan for uh, undertaking this. <coughs> okay, for today, we will begin with uh, quite uh, quite an elaborate uh, introduction to graph theory. You, many of you probably have uh, some idea of uh, what uh, graph theory does. Let me, let me just begin by saying, see uh, some years ago, um, Professor Katre knows <laughs> about this. Uh, it is true that uh, I did teach graph theory as Professor Gopal Krishnan mentioned uh, quite correctly, but it is not that uh, I have done quite a lot of teaching of graph theory. This is something I, I did not really do my PhD in the area of graph theory. Okay? So, <laughs> I did my PhD in, in some other area and then uh, because of the problems that uh, I faced in the area that I was working, mathematical problems that I faced in the area I was working in, I had to read graph theory. I really had to read graph theory. and. Uh, that actually explains sort of the importance of graph theory at a common man's level, at a mathematician's level. You need to learn graph theory no matter if you are doing anything else, any part of mathematics that you may be doing. You end up reading something on graph theory because one is required to do so. The graph theory occupies a prime place uh, among the among the topics in discrete mathematics under the big heading of discrete mathematics this is a major area graph theory uh, both in terms of research and teaching it's a major area because it has far more much more <laughs> uh, tentacles ramifications in other fields than any other branch of uh, discrete mathematics has. <coughs> Please uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have. Okay. Uh, particularly today, I am not in a great hurry to uh, finish anything. So, uh, absolutely feel free to ask anything uh, which you may have in mind. Okay, rather than uh, beginning uh, introducing graph theory at, uh, with the standard problem, maybe I can start with uh, one problem which uh, many of you are familiar with. You pr probably know that there is this question of six people. And there are acquaintances. Every two persons are either friends or enemies. Do you know this? We heard about this, no? Uh, then you have to show that either there are three people who are friends of each other. Or there are three people. So these three friend, friend, friend or Have you seen an argument uh, for this? 
Yes, uh, he is nodding his head. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Take any person. Yes. Take any one of the six people. Take any person. Yes. Uh, yes, the other five are his friends or anyway, yeah, then? Yeah, yeah, he either has three friends or three enemies, that's exactly the thing. You begin with one person, so he, you can assume that he has three friends. So these three are his friends, they are all friends. Then? Yeah. If we assume without loss of generality that they are all friends, yes. then there are f f of then they have three yeah. lines. If there. these two people are friends, then I am through. That is exactly the kind yeah. of thing I am looking for. If none of them are friends, then they are all enemies. If and none of them are friends, then you have this uh, yeah. picture here. Then there, are, then there are three people who are enemies of each other. Mm -hmm. That's, That's correct. correct. Thank you. This uh, naive looking thing, which is incidentally based on the argument that he is making is based on pigeonhole principle. Okay? It is based on pigeonhole principle. This is the beginning of uh, an area in graph theory called Ramsey theory. So, this is uh, one of the foremost Ramsey theorems. <coughs> Let us give an example of something which uh, for which the answer I am not going to give at the moment. This we could answer immediately. So, it should not create an impression that we can probably answer everything in graph theory immediately. Uh, okay. I have a set of n people. Each person has a piece of information with him. Every person has a different piece of information with him. So, there are n bits of n pieces of information and they want to make phone calls. They want to make uh, phone calls. Uh, phone is a two way, it is a two way track. So, when A phones B, uh, A and B both can hear each other. What that means is of course, at a minimal level whatever information A has, he can pass it to B and whatever information B has, he that gets, so they will share com common information. At the end of that phone call, they will share common information, because uh, it is a two way track. We want to make uh, number of phone calls, so that at the end of all these phone calls, every person would get all the n pieces of information. One, one dumb way of handling this is, uh, you ask all of them to make phone calls to each other. How many phone calls would be required? If every person phones the other, there would be as many as n choose 2. This of course, is clearly not a good way. So many phone calls, there is wastage of phone calls here. It is not really needed. What else can be done? You can appoint one person, call him leader. So he is sort of a receiver. So if there are five people, then the leader makes uh, phones to all these people. So this person. So, leader gets information from A1, he gets information from A2, from A3 and then from A4. So, he, so at the end of these four phone calls, the leader would have received information from four people, all the remaining people, besides his own information of course. Leader has his own information piece. Then, he makes four more phone calls. He phones A1, he phones A2, he phones A3, he phones A4 and uh, tells, gives all the information to these. Okay?
how many phone calls would be required in this way? There are as many as n minus 1 phone calls initially, there are n is 5 here. n minus 1 phone calls that a leader makes to transmit the information back, making a total of uh, 2 n minus 2. There is a level of economy that you can achieve here. Namely, it's, it's clear, see if you agree with me, uh, leader makes phone call to A1, he makes a phone call to A2, third phone call to A3, fourth phone call to A4. After the fourth phone call is made, you don't stop there, you, don't, you tell A4 that don't put the phone down because when leader receives information from A4, he has all the information. Therefore, one can cut short on one, one phone call. Is that clear? I mean, this need not be n minus 1, it could be n minus 2. You can uh, save on one phone call. Trick that obviously you cannot play with everybody, that is not possible because <laughs> these phone calls are made before. Only the last phone call that, the last piece of information that he gets, he can economize on that. So one phone call less. Just see if there are three people Then this gives me 2 times 3 minus 3 equal to 3. I want to say that 3 phone calls would be required actually. 3 phone calls would be required because no matter what, there has to be a communication between B1 and B2. There has to be from B from B1 and B2, B1 and B3. Even after getting these uh, pieces of information, even if he shares the, all the information with B3, still B2 has to be given the information. He can get that information either from B1, so this could be the first phone call, this could be second phone call, but even then the B2 has not gotten all the information. Therefore, either he receives it from B3 or from B1, therefore three phone calls are required. We require at least three phone calls here. You really cannot do this just with two phone calls. One certainly is impossible, but just with two also, it's not, just with two, the one person will get all the information, but the other two also have to receive all the information, which is something that cannot be achieved just with two phone calls. This is fine. I had three people here. Suppose I had four people, I can be a bit smarter than this. There are four people. Instead of one leader, you appoint four leaders. You ask four people to be leaders. Remaining n minus four people are divided into four subsets. all the remaining fellows, they are attached to one of them, <coughs> one of A, B, C, D. So, the, there are as many as four leaders. Each person will make phone call to all of his followers. How many phone calls are required that way? I require as many as n minus four phone calls. This way, there is a collection center here. He has received information from uh, his followers. Now, A and B can exchange information and C and D can exchange information. That way I require two more phone calls. Okay. At the end of this, A has all the information of his followers, also the information from B and also from the followers of B, all of it. C has information from his followers also from D and also followers of D. Of course, there is still no information passage between A and C. So, 
So A and C phone each other. Doesn't matter who phones whom. <coughs> After this, A will get information from his followers, the followers of B, followers of C, followers of D and therefore all of them actually. So at the end of this, A has all the pieces of information, B has all the pieces of information, C has all the pieces of information, symmetry and D has all the pieces of information. Now they transmit the information back to their followers. this is smaller. This number is smaller. It is one call smaller than <laughs> what we got here. This is 2n minus 3, that is 2n minus 4. So you can save on one phone call. But you see, the whole idea is mathematicians are ambitious people. Once you draw this kind of picture, there will be people who will say, why have four leaders, why not have ten leaders? Because if you have thousand people, you may as well divide them into ten different groups. And this is a, what is called the gossip problem. In fact, there are gossip schemes in graph theory. So the theorem that I don't want to prove today, but <laughs> something for which graph theory is certainly the key is that if is the smallest. You, no matter how smart you are, you cannot do anything better than this. There are no schemes that you can devise which will, which will work with a smaller number of phone calls. It is not possible to do that. Yes, it's called the gossip theorem. It doesn't matter how you arrange things, but you cannot do any. So this is absolutely the <laughs> smallest number that you can get. You cannot get anything smaller than this. Yes, so that is, uh, uh, <laughs> for those who like to take challenges, this is good enough reason to study graph theory. Okay by studying graph theory, I can prove such theorems. Such kinds of theorems can be proved using graph, graph theory. So I gave you one example of a fine. So question was about, uh, about a game. No, about nah. um, application of graph theory. So that uh, means if, uh, certain, in certain area there are uh, 10 talks and uh, they, are, they are integrated Okay, this question the answer is of the same general nature as the use of mathematics itself. I mean, uh, what way is mathematics useful in sciences or to the society, etc. We all say that mathematics is very useful. Uh, etc. But uh, the thing is, uh, it is useful in the sense that uh, your real life problem, you have to model it. You have to model it, make a model out of it, so that mathematics can actually be used to solve that problem. Same thing is true about graph theory. One has to put this in a proper graph theory language, so that the problem actually becomes, it is possible to solve it using some things, uh, some knowledge in graph theory that one has. Okay. This problem certainly is one of the types that uh, graph theorists would like to look at. Okay. It's a typical problem that uh, graph theorists deal with. 
one. This is called the, these ideas are called domination numbers, independence numbers of graphs, etc. Okay. So they are quite related to the graph parameters that we'll be looking at. That is the main thing that the use of graph theory. One has to make a right model so that the graph theory, graph theory that one knows actually can be applied. Well, let me dwell further on history, history of the subject. There is a book, a three authored book called Graph Theory. In fact, there are many books on graph theory, but this one Seventeen thirty-six to nineteen thirty-six. What is special <coughs> about this? This is a three-authored book. Uh, Cambridge. Graph theory is supposed to have begun in the year 1736. What is special about the year 1736? There is a famous problem uh, that is called the Koenig's uh, bridge problem. In the city of Koenigsberg, Koenigsberg bridge problem, there were uh, seven bridges, two mainlands, two islands in the river two islands in the river and seven bridges connecting these mainland with bridges with the islands and islands among each other. The question was that of going over every bridge exactly once. There are seven bridges. You have to cross each bridge exactly once and come back to the same point from which you started. And this question was posed to the mathematician Euler. So Euler was asked this question. King of Prussia actually asked Euler this question and uh, Euler came out uh, with the answer that it cannot be done. It really cannot be done. So this is, uh, that was in the year 1736 and that is beginning of graph theory. The term graph theory was not used by Euler. He didn't really use the term graph theory himself. <coughs> it came much later with uh, people like Cayley, Cayley, uh, mathematician Cayley, term graph theory for the first time. So that book has uh, a number of articles during this 200 year period. Okay original articles. <coughs> In fact, uh, graph theory as a term uh, uh, was not really all that popular till uh, almost uh, 1950 or 60. The most uh, distinguished uh, graph theorist whose name is Tut. There will be theorems of uh, Tut that we will be looking at. <coughs> uh, 
he essentially spent uh, most of his later period of his life at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And uh, Tuck did his PhD at Cambridge University in England in uh, 1938-40. Tuck submitted his thesis to the Mathematics Department of Cambridge University and the title of the thesis was some studies in topology. It was some studies in studies in topology was the title. Why is that? Because graph theory as a term was not really fashionable in England those days. It was not at all fashionable. If you look at Tut's thesis itself, in fact there was a talk that Tut gave in 1985, I was in the audience, <laughs> called My Thesis. There was something like seven chapters to Tut's thesis in 1938-40 and each one of these seven chapters has actually become a separate uh, big area in graph theory. It has become uh, by itself, uh, it has become a matter of research, seven independent topics that have uh, become very big areas in graph theory. So Tut himself did not call it graph theory, he could not call it graph theory then. <coughs> Mathematician Whitehead, you probably know Russell and Whitehead. Whitehead called <laughs> graph theory a slums of topology. Okay, so that's quite derogatory term. It's a very derogatory term. He called results in graph theory as slums, on, slums on topology. That is, uh, that impression uh, doesn't uh, quite hold anymore. Uh, if you look at this book, uh, those of you who have uh, application oriented, there is a book around 1974, Narsingh Dev. It's essentially, it's called Applied Graph Theory. And uh, this is it. Yes. Uh, as the title says, it is applied graph theory and uh, Narsingh Dev himself says that uh, prior to 1959 there were hardly any books in graph theory. Then around 1959, uh, Barkhoff and Maclean wrote a book uh, on graph theory. So that was the first book of its kind. 1974, only half a dozen books on graph theory are known. So his uh, actually lamenting, he is very unhappy that uh, very few books on graph theory are known, etc. And if you look at uh, what is true in 2009 or 2010, uh, just to quote a review for a book in, uh, book review in the Bulletin of uh, American Math Society, graph theory is what uh, the reviewer calls precocious child. So it's a very prolific uh, child of mathematics, uh, says the reviewer. Uh, just to score the point further, uh, you know that in the next month, uh, Professor Gatre would be attending it also. The, there is the International Congress of Mathematics. Uh, that event is to happen in Hyderabad, August, August 2010. The president of uh, International Mathematical Union who will be actually presiding over this, his name is Loash. And he is a graph theorist, he is a leading graph theorist today. So last four years he has been president of the <laughs> International Mathematical Union and he will be heading the, he will be presiding over the International Congress of Mathematics. Uh, my knowledge is the first time a graph theorist has gotten an honor ever <laughs> since the International Congress began. Okay. <coughs> so that much for the increasing importance of graph theory. Incidentally, that book is called Applied Graph Theory. So that uh, brings home the point that there are aspects of graph theory that, that are more applied than uh, 
than pure. I mean, the term applied is used the term applied is used to as opposed to pure just to say that uh, this involves more applications in the usual setting of graph theory applied would mean something uh, the results that are generally applied to the area of computer science okay so what people have in mind when they say applied graph theory is applications to computer science is that clear so uh, main customer of uh, graph theory is computer science as opposed to pure graph theory that some people do indulge in incidentally this person the, so half the books on graph theory that are written actually they are by people who work in computer science and remaining half of the books are professional mathematicians they are in mathematics departments and there may be some that uh, that do both overlap uh, of both of these things <coughs> Graph theory also takes credit for many. <laughs> One more thing. Uh, there is a famous theorem called the four color theorem. Have you, has anyone heard about it? Yeah. What is it? Huh? You have heard about it, but you don't know the statement exactly. Is anyone, even vaguely? Like you have a map of India, where the states have to be given colors. If there are 25 states, of course, you don't use as many as 25 colors. You don't do that. I mean. <laughs> no map maker will actually use uh, 25 different colors. That's not is what is done. You try to use less number of colors. So, of course, uh, if the two states have uh, share a border in common, such as Maharashtra and Karnataka or Maharashtra and Andhra, now obviously <laughs> they cannot be given the same color, okay? Uh, because otherwise it will look like one state, which it is not. So, uh, states that are uh, sharing a border in common, adjacent states, have to be given different colors. But with this requirement, for example, Maharashtra and uh, Jharkhand or Uttar Pradesh or West Bengal can be given the same color. That would be, that would be quite alright because they don't share boundary in, in common. The question here is what is the least number of colors that you will have to use? And the four color theorem says that uh, no matter how many how many states you have how many countries you have etc four colors are sufficient four colors are quite sufficient to color any thing that you draw on a plane no matter how small or big etc what is so special about uh, this theorem was uh, there are several things <laughs> special but <laughs> In fact, uh, initially it, this was a conjecture. Uh, let me dwell on this for a while. The, this is a question of uh, drawing graphs on a plane. I'll get to this. Plane is uh, one kind of surface. There are other, other types of surfaces. And uh, so, if you look at uh, something like a torus ring, then it's a surface which is uh, topologically different. It is topologically very different from a sphere or a plane. And uh, instead of torus, you can have a double torus or things like that. You can have uh, put handles here. For each one of these surfaces except the plane or sphere, 
what was known was the least number of colors uh, required it was known earlier only for plane this was not known plane was open and this was a question 1896 or these kinds of questions were answered but for plane the answer was not known and people did try once the answer is not known people try to attempt like farmer's last theorem uh, before it was actually proved there were thousands of wrong proofs that were given <laughs> so similarly for this problem many many <laughs> incorrect proofs were given in fact one proof that was given and uh, that is what is now called the five color theorem stayed for almost 15 years nobody challenged it what that means is people accepted that as a proof and then someone pointed a hole in the in the proof that that's not correct proof but for 15 years people accepted that <coughs> and that continued for uh, quite some time 1970s uh, the four color theorem was proved in 1975 by three mathematicians from university of michigan <coughs> two actually apple and hacken and what is the special thing that i want to <laughs> tell you here is this is the first instance of to my knowledge of a mathematical statement being proved using computers this is the first instance where a statement which is concretely a mathematical statement was actually proved using computers how did they do that uh, they reduced it to checking of uh, uh, something like 1000 odd cases so about 1000 uh, different statements that you want to check so instead of 10 power 30 or 40 cases this you reduce it to checking only 1000 cases these were actually checked over computer they were actually checked over over computer and that also took quite long time first the computers that were available that time were very primitive they were far more primitive than the kinds of uh, systems that you use that uh, essentially even in 1980 or 85 the computers that were available were not uh, uh, they were quite slow so those were those kinds of computing devices were used and uh, the four color theorem was proved in that manner there were number of mathematicians who did uh, didn't believe that that is a proof okay for quite some time people said that no that is not a proof but then slowly the world came around to accepting that such kinds of things also have to be accepted as proofs and now what has happened is after after more than 30 40 years people are now willing to accept all such kinds of things as proofs computers are not just used to prove Uh, statements of theorems in graph theory they are used in all the pure mathematics branches such as algebra number theory various kinds of things okay there is no escape computers are actually used to prove uh, very very difficult statements you still have to do quite lot of analysis yourself and feed it to a computer so that it has to handle much less number of cases but this was the first uh, first example of this kind where the computers were actually used to prove a concrete mathematical theorem <coughs> therefore historically it is of uh, sufficient importance even now there is no proof <laughs> that uh, does not use a computer 1997 some some parts in the proof were simplified but there is no computer free proof of the four color theorem that is available maybe some day it will become available but that also in turn you try to reduce the use of computers and uh, sometimes succeed okay there are many applications of uh, 
graph uh, theory you may have heard of uh, uh, traveling salesman problem one of the yes he's nodding his head yeah, have you huh what is it he has to uh, deliver maximum number of i mean uh, deliver his products to different places uh, in minimum number of steps in the city no okay you have some nub, some cities with you yes yeah then so he has to travel from he has to travel, travel between cities between yes cities to uh, sell his products in minimum number of uh, in minimum distance or yeah. minimum number of steps yeah he wants to reduce the cost yeah. the idea is to reduce the cost this could be as many as uh, yeah 25 states thank you 25 states in india 25 capitals you want to visit all these capitals uh, from the capital of maharashtra mumbai where i live i have to visit all these capitals come back <laughs> to mumbai there, there are costs involved I'm going from Lucknow to Patna, there may be some co price involved. Going from uh, Bhopal to Hyderabad, there's cost involved and so on. Uh, how should I minimize so that the total cost, total cost, I want to minimize the total cost. Visit each city exactly once, come, come back to where I started. And do this in such a way that uh, it involves uh, least amount. I don't want to spend more money. So this is what is called the traveling salesman problem. TSP Incidentally, is an example of a situation what computer science people call NP complete. It is, <laughs> it is an example of a problem what is called NP complete problem. What does that mean? We will talk in this course about algorithms. <coughs> so some algorithms are good, some algorithms are not good. How do you, which algorithms are considered good? The algorithms that take in terms of input the amount of time efforts that it takes if it is linear if it is quadratic if it is polynomial in terms of input then it is called good algorithm polynomial time algorithm so this is an example of a situation where you do not have a polynomial time algorithm nor are you sure that there is no polynomial time algorithm okay nobody has found any polynomial time algorithm. So, traveling salesman problem, which <coughs> for a standard, the standard graph theory language is uh, part of what is called the Hamilton cycle problem. That is uh, an NP complete problem given a graph whether it, you want to visit every fellow exactly once and come back can you do that or you cannot do it. You see what it means is if you can do it for example if I give you some cities such that there are some roads between not all cities are connected. Can I visit every city exactly once and come back to the same city? If you can, then you can actually produce that look, this is the way you go about and you can show that this can be done. But if you cannot, that is a much more difficult thing to say. How do you know that it cannot be done at all? Okay. <laughs> For such questions, if you can do it, it's easy to exhibit that look, this is the solution. This is the way you go, go around. But if you want to say that, no, no, I cannot do this, then it's far more difficult because, see, that is as good as saying that there cannot be any person who is smarter than, <laughs> smarter than you and he can, 
there may be some person who is smarter than me. Just because I cannot do it doesn't mean that nobody can do it. Okay? So these are the kinds of things that uh, we will be looking at. Then there is a famous uh, matchmaker problem. There is a set of certain number of boys and certain number of girls and the matchmaker has a list of uh, suitability list. Uh, every boy has a certain suitable list with him. Not all girls are suitable for, <laughs> for all boys. That doesn't happen. For each boy, he has a certain list of uh, girls that are suitable for him. And for each girl, there is a list of uh, boys that are suitable for, for her. Assuming that suitability is a two-way track. Okay. That a boy and girl pair is suitable. The, what would be the job of matchmaker? The job of matchmaker would be to arrange as large number of marriages as possible. Okay. <laughs> Try to maximize the number of marriages he can. Maybe sometimes this is done uh, purely out of philanthropic <laughs> pursuits. Sometimes he, he even makes a living out of it or, <laughs> or so on. But this is an important question. This certainly is an important question. One doesn't, uh, this sort of uh, amusing, but this does happen very commonly, even in terms of uh, jobs that are offered and applications, job, applic job applicants. Not every person is suitable to do every job. This is quite the case. This is, qu <laughs> this is absolutely true. Nobody can do everything. Okay? Not all jobs are suitable for every applicant. Then you want to make a pairing that this job be given to this applicant, that job be given to that applicant. And this question, this is called matching theory. Then there are problems of uh, scheduling classes. What are the requirements? This happens typically in any college. Okay? There are certain classrooms available. The times when those classrooms are available, those are made known. And there are departments. Each department wants to have the best slot for itself, etc. So this is what is called the timetabling problem. Suppose the timetable problem is usually with the, <laughs> in colleges it is the vice principal <laughs> of the college. So what does he have to see? He has to see to it that departments don't quarrel with each other. And uh, the rooms are used as optimally as possible. No room remains vacant. Uh, so all through the day rooms, uh, rooms get used. Uh, and the requirements of departments are satisfied in as much as possible. Okay. So this is sort of uh, the beginning about uh, applications that uh, we will be looking at. I will start with the basic definitions after the break. Thank you.